conscious you all have had very full submissions this morning, and I've probably gone rather tough. Um, I'm conscious that uh, your lordships haven't heard anything from me on the, on the merits of the ground three. I, I don't think we need to at this stage. <coughs> um, the, the particular point that they were was supposing we're against you on so questions one and two. What should we do about the application for the extension of time and Lord Justice Lewis's disposal of it? Well, my my, my, lord, my lord, as it as it stands, um, it, it, my lord, I'm content to rely on the permission to appeal skeleton. If I need to put in a supplemental um, skeleton argument to um, flesh out parts of the, um, um, <clears throat> but um, I'm not I'm not sure there's any more I, I could or need to say, and, and I dealt with. My lord, I don't need to put in another skeleton. I don't. I don't. What happened? Quick query: what, what the status of the current one is? But <laughs> I'm, I'm content to, uh, to, to rely, on <laughs> rely on the PTA one. Yes. Um, and my lord, I only to say that obviously my um, the grounds of review and the skeleton argument for this um, hearing uh, should, should be read as part of my submission. August skeleton on, on any points of the on the merits. Yes. I think we'll rise for a moment. <laughs> Thank you.
Pierce Smith, we, we needn't trouble you. I'll ask Lord Justice DG to give the first judgment. I'll preface this judgment with saying what should be obvious to everybody in court that it has <coughs> not been considered at great length and will not come out as a polished judgment, but we thought it better that the parties should know where they stand straight away, given that the substantive appeal is due to be heard in under two weeks' time. The question in this application is whether the appellant, Mr Dorian Williams, already has, or can and should now be granted, permission to appeal on ground three of his grounds of appeal. He undoubtedly does have permission from Lord Justice Lewison on ground five of his grounds of appeal, and his appeal is due to be heard shortly. The underlying facts are not of central importance to today's application, but briefly, the appellant brought an action against two of his siblings, Mr Gerwin Williams and Mrs Susan and the executors of his father's estate, asserting that he was entitled to ownership of two farms in Neath in Wales, which were farmed together as a single holding, one called Crithen of about 50 acres, and one called Kefin Coed of about 144 acres. His claims were put forward on two alternative bases. Firstly, that the farms been had been contributed as assets to a partnership which was established between himself and his parents in 1985, with the result, so it was said, that on the death of his parents, his mother in 2013 and then his father in 2018, the entire interest in the farm passed or inured to him, and secondly, that he had a claim to both farms by proprietary estoppel on the basis that his parents encouraged him to believe that they would be his and he had acted in reliance on them. The action was tried by his honour Judge Jarman, sitting as a judge of the High Court in Cardiff, in June 2022. He handed down judgment on the 4th of July 2022 at 2022 EWHC 1717 Chancery. And in that judgment, he dismissed both ways of putting Mr. Dorian Williams's claims. He later also refused him permission to appeal. The appellant applied for permission to appeal in his appellant's notice, relying initially on six and after amendment on seven grounds of appeal. Grounds two and three were directed at the partnership issues in relation to Chrisom and Kefin Coed respectively. Ground five was directed at a subsidiary issue. Kefin Coed had been acquired in the joint names of the appellant and both his parents. There was in the conveyance or transfer no express declaration of trust and that gave rise to a question whether it was acquired as by them as beneficial joint tenants or as beneficial tenants in common. The judge held that they were tenants in common in equal shares with the result that the appellant was entitled to a third share. By ground five, he contended that the judge should have held that Kefin Coed was initially acquired by the three of them as joint tenants. That, as I understand it, would mean that on his mother's death, that Kefin Coed 
would be held by him and his father jointly. And since his father had severed joint tenancy in, I think, 2014, the appellant would now hold a half interest of tenants in common with his father's estate. The permission for appeal application came before Lord Justice Lewison. He dealt with it, as is very common with permission applications in this court, on paper. The decision is dated 24 October 2022. It is headed after the title order in capitals made by the Right Honourable Lord Justice Lewison. There is then a box for the decision which reads granted on grounds three and five, refused on all other grounds. And then he made provision for a partial stay of costs. There is then a separate box giving reasons, which in this case sets out in some detail his reasons for his decisions. Paragraph two of the reasons is headed partnership asset and deals specifically with the claim in relation to Crithen. Paragraph three reads as follows. Kevin Coed was bought in the names of Mr. and Mrs. Williams and Dorian and there was no express declaration of beneficial ownership. In the light of Stack and Dowden, it is arguable that the judge began from the wrong starting point. But if there was a beneficial joint tenancy at the outset, it was severed by notice given on 4th of March 2014. Permission to appeal on grounds 3 and 5 is granted, limited to the question whether Dorian is entitled to a beneficial interest in Kevin Curd. The respondents, with I think some justification, thought that the precise ambit of the permission Lord Justice Lewison had thereby granted was not entirely clear. On the 25th of October, they wrote to the court, headed urgent, asking, quite simply, in relation to paragraph three of the order, please, could you please clarify whether permission has been granted to appeal the issue of whether or not Kevin Coed Farms is a partnership asset? response came by email the next day. Dear sirs, thank you for your letter. Lord Justice Lewison has confirmed that permission to appeal on the question whether Kevin Coed was a partnership asset has not been granted. The appellant uh, sought to challenge that in a number of different ways which it is not necessary in this brief judgment to go through, ultimately culminating in an application to the Supreme Court, which was refused by the Supreme Court. After these various applications had failed, he asked for an extension of time under the direction of the court, that he needed one, to put in a replacement appeal skeleton. That replacement appeal skeleton sought to argue both grounds three <coughs> and grounds five. Indeed, its introduction reads as follows. This appeal raises an important point of principle as to the proper approach of a court to the evidential value of partnership accounts, and in particular where the evidential burden lies in the face of partnership accounts which are on the face of it conclusive as to the ensuing proceeding. And then elaborates underground three partnership property from paragraphs 22 to 65. The Question, uh, 55 questions of partnership property in relation to Kevin Kevin Kurd. 
and for good measure, paragraphs 56 and 65, sought to argue that if the appellant was right on the impact of the partnership account in relation to Kepp and Co., the same should apply to Crisson, despite the fact that there was no doubt that Lord Justice Lewison had refused permission for ground two of the grounds of appeal, which raised that question. The application for an extension of time also came before Lord Justice Lewison, who again decided it on paper. His order this time is dated 21st of September 2023. I think since this is the order which we are asked to review, I should read most of it. In the box marked decision, he simply says see below. In the box marked reasons, he said as follows, the reasons for the grant of limited permission to appeal made it clear that permission was limited to the question whether Dorian was entitled to a beneficiary interest in Kepp and Coed. That limitation meant that no permission was granted in relation to the question whether Kepp and Coed was a partnership asset. I was asked to clarify whether permission had been granted on that question and confirmed that it had not been. The formal parts of the order must be read in the light of the reasons given for it. I also confirmed the limitation in my order of 25th November. It says 2021 must mean 2022, when the appellant asked for reconsideration of my grant of permission. Despite that, and despite the appellant's many attempts to reopen my order, the proposed skeleton argument ignores that limitation. Two, to the extent that the formal parts of my order and paragraph three of my reasons refer to ground three, that may have created an ambiguity. If so, that was an accidental error, which I correct under CPR 40.12. And then he gives reasons why he does that. Three, as foreshadowed in my order of 25th November, again he says 2021, an attempt to sidestep the refusal of permission to appeal is an abuse of process. The proposed skeleton argument also seeks to reopen the refusal of permission in relation to Crisson, despite the refusal of an application on CPR 5230. Regrettably, therefore, I consider it in both respects, paragraphs one and two and 22 to 65, the proposed appellant's notice of appeal. Does amount to an abuse of process? In those circumstances, one possibility is simply to dismiss the application for an extension of time, but that would be a draconian step in view of the limited permission that has been given. I direct, therefore, that the appellant must serve a replacement skeleton argument limited to the issue on which permission has been given for the avoidance of that. That does not include the issue of a Kevin Coed as a partnership asset. <coughs> By this application, the appellant seeks a review of that order under a number of rules. As clarified in argument this morning, three questions arise. The first question is whether Mr. Dorian Williams already has permission to appeal on ground three. Mr. Guy Adams, who appeared for him, argued that he did, that it had been given by Lord Justice Lewis in unambiguous terms in his original decision, and that was that. However, I take a different view. If Lord Justice Lewis's decision had been left in its original form, I conceive that there would have been room for argument about it, as indeed Lord Justice Lewis recognised in the recent decision that I have read from. On the one hand, the decision box said that permission was granted, limited to grounds three and five, and ground three did raise the partnership question in relation to Kevin Coed. On the other hand, paragraph three of the reasons limited the issue for which permission was granted to the question of beneficial ownership. And in the circumstances, and in particular by reference to the appellant's 
skeleton fishing here. One can see why that might be thought, but been confined to the question whether the beneficial interests on acquisition were joint or tenancy, joint tenancy or tenancy in common. But there is no need to grapple with these difficulties, leaving aside the fact that L Lord Justice Lewison was almost immediately asked and almost immediately answered whether he had intended to grant permission for the partnership to proceed. More recently, as is apparent from the order I read, he corrected his original decision under the slip rule. The slip rule is found in CPR rule 40.12. It reads as follows, correction of errors in judgments and orders. One, the court may at any time correct an accidental slip of permission in a judgment or order. Two, a party may apply for a correction without notice. I think it's clear that although a party may apply for a correction, the court can also correct an order which contains an accidental slip of its own motion. Lord Justice Lewison, as I read, said that the inclusion of Grand's tree was an accidental error. And he provided, I didn't read this bit, but it's at the end of paragraph two of that order, the order should therefore be read as if no permission were granted under Grand tree. I do not think we can go behind Lord Justice Lewison's statement that his original decision contains an accidental error in including reference to Grand 3. So the only question that is left is whether the slip rule applied to his original decision. That, it seems to me, depends on whether it is an order within the meaning of CPR 40.12. We have not been referred to, and it has not been suggested, that the CPR contains any definitions of order. But to my mind, the decision made by Lord Justice Lewison when granting limited permission to appeal is quite plainly an order. It is called an order on its face. It is made by a judge. <coughs> this is what is expressly envisaged by the CPR, CPR 52.5, provides under the heading determination of applications for permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal, where an application for permission to appeal is made to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal will determine the application on paper without an oral hearing, except as provided for under paragraph 2. Two, the judge considering the application on paper may direct that the application be determined at an oral hearing and must so direct that the judge is of the opinion that the application cannot be fairly determined on paper without an oral hearing. That therefore envisages that the decision of the Court of Appeal on an application for permission, or as the wording of the rule suggests, the determination of that application, will be dealt with on paper by a judge. And that is what, in the vast majority of cases, does happen. What is more, CPR 52.6 provides, <coughs> one, except where rule 52.7 applies, permission to appeal may be given only where, A, the court considers that the appeal would have a real prospect of success, or B, there is some other compelling reason for the appeal to be heard. Two, an order giving permission under this rule, or under rule 52.7, may, A, limit the issues to be heard, and B, be made subject to petition. It can be seen that what the rules envisage is not only the determination of the application for permission to appeal, 
appeal by the Court of Appeal will be made on paper by a judge unless it is adjourned in the court and that the question for that judge is whether the appeal would have a real prospect of success or there is some other compelling reason for the appeal to be adjourned, which is described in terms of the matter of appeal called equitable mootness, whether the court considers the appeal would have a real prospect of success, thereby envisages that the judge deciding the application of Wentz is for these purposes the court, and for good measure, that 52.62 refers to an order giving permission under this rule. In all those circumstances, it seems to me that the decision made by the justices was an order and could be amended under the slip rule. The suggestion that it is not an order depends partly on some passing remarks by Lord Halsbury in Lane and Esther, AC 210, which were not actually the ground of decision. And in any event, were concerned with the construction of different statutory provisions in what must be admitted were very different times procedurally. And an argument which was, to my mind, quite convoluted and difficult to follow, to the effect that decisions made on paper by a judge do not count as real decisions of a court. That just seems to me to be wrong. What rules envisage is that decisions of the court can be made on paper, and in particular, as we have seen under 52.5, that these decisions, decisions by the Court of Appeal of whether permission to appeal should be granted, will usually be made on paper by a single Lord or Lady Justice. That, contrary to a submission of Mr. Adamson, seems to me to be plainly an exercise of judicial decision-making and not an administrative or executive decision in any sense at all. It is true that in most cases, decisions made on paper by courts are subject to a right by the person affected to have them reviewed at an oral hearing. But that does not mean that the decision on paper was not a judicial decision. And to my mind, a decision made by a judge exercising judicial powers reached on paper and stamped with the court seal is an order, which indeed is how it's described on its face. Any alternative view would mean that there was no power to correct accidental slips in orders made without a hearing, which I think would cause serious inconvenience. Orders on paper are constantly being made at every level of judicial hierarchy up and down the land. And I have no doubt that accidental slips, such as a date, as indeed it appears that Justice Lewis seemed to himself made in his most recent decision, or a decimal point being put in the wrong place, or an order putting claimant for defendant and vice versa, a very common occurrence or the like, are frequently made and no doubt frequently corrected. No sensible purpose would be served by construing Order 40, Rule 12, as not extending to such decisions. I therefore conclude that Lord Justice Lewis had the power to correct the original order. He exercised that power. We cannot go behind his statement that his original order contained an accidental slip. We have been given, in my judgment, no reason at all to revisit that aspect of his order. For consequence, I think that the judgment of the Court of Appeal should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adamson.
consequence is that the answer to the first question of a Mr. Dorian Williams, Williams already has been shown to be a Dorian Williams case, should, in my judgment, be denied. That leads to the second question, which is whether the court, after hearing the substantive appeal, can grant leave for a ground of appeal which has already been refused by a single member of the court in the Pay Fund case. My answer to that is also no, save in the very narrow and exceptional circumstances where the appellant can bring himself within CPR Rule 5230. Mr. Adams accepted that there were a number of decisions, decisions to that effect before 2016. It is not necessary to refer to them all. But they were, in fact, referred to by my Lord, Lord Justice Newey, at an earlier stage of this saga. The most recent one being McHugh and McHugh, 2014, EWCA, Sid 1671. Where Lord Justice Lewison, at paragraph 14, said, where permission to appeal is given on limited grounds, it is not open to an appellant to broaden the grounds on the hearing of the appeal himself. Mr. Adams had two submissions. One was that decisions of this court on merely procedural matters cannot bind subsequent, this court at subsequent hearings, something for which he cited no authority that came anywhere near persuading me that it was correct, and which as a matter of principle I think must be wrong. The second and more far-reaching submission was that whatever the position before 2016, when a disappointed appellant who had been refused permission for certain grounds on paper could renew his application at an oral hearing. The same was not true now when the right of renewal at an oral hearing has been removed. I do not see why that affects the principle. I was wholly unpersuaded by Mr. Adams, as I've already touched on, that the decision of a single Lord Justice on behalf of the court on paper is in some way not a decision of the court, or not a judicial decision, or not carefully considered, or was in some way an exercise of delegated or administrative or executive power. As I have already referred to, by CPR Rule 52.5, the decision of a single Lord Justice on paper is the determination of the Court of Appeal on the question of permission. As I've already said, unlike other decisions, that cannot be, the disappointed appellant cannot, as of right, require that to be reconsidered at a hearing. That is the effect of CPR 52.246, which reads, a party may request a decision of a single judge made without a hearing, brackets other than a decision made on or beyond a paragraph 5, and a decision determining an application for permission to appeal to be reconsidered. That was, as is well known, a deliberate change introduced in 2016 to limit the right of would-be appellants to renew their application for permission. And in 
incidentally, uh, it seems to me that there is not the slightest doubt that a decision granting permission limited to certain grounds is both a decision granting permission on those grounds and a decision refusing permission on all other grounds and is within the meaning of CPR Rule 52.246, a decision determining an application for permission to appeal and is therefore caught by that paragraph. But none of that, to my mind, undermines or affects the principle of the cases which I have referred to as exemplified by McHugh and McHugh. That once the court has made a decision refusing permission on a particular ground, that cannot be reopened at the hearing of the substantive appeal. <coughs> Nor indeed uh, can it be appealed. It is intended to be a final decision. That is subject to Rule 52.30, which does allow decisions on applications for permission to appeal to be reopened in exceptional circumstances. 52.30, headed Reopening Final Appeal, provides one, the Court of Appeals or the High Court will not reopen a final determination of any appeal unless A, it is necessary to do so in order to avoid real injustice, B, the circumstances are exceptional and make it appropriate to reopen the appeal, and C, if there is no alternative effective remedy. Paragraph 2, in paragraphs 1, 3, 4, and 6, appeal includes an application for permission to appeal. Mr. Adams suggests that that meant that only where an application for permission to appeal was refused in its entirety so that there would be no appeal was 52.30 applicable. That is not how I read it, nor, to my mind, a natural reading. A natural reading of subparagraphs 1 and 2 is that the Court of Appeal will not reopen a final determination of any application for permission to appeal unless the three conditions are satisfied. I, to my mind, have no doubt that Lord Justice Lewis's decision was the final determination of Mr. Dorian Williams's application for permission to appeal. It finally determined that permission should be granted on some grounds and not others. Once corrected under the slip rule, it finally determined that he had permission to appeal on ground five, but no permission to appeal on any of the other grounds, and in particular not on ground three. In order to reopen that question, it is necessary for him to come within Rule 52.30, because 52.31, as I said, provides that the Court of Appeal will not otherwise reopen a final determination of the application for permission to appeal. Mr. Adams had not previously on this application suggested that Lord Justice Lewis's determination should be reopened under 52.30, but in the course of his submissions this morning, he made an oral application under that rule. By 52.34, he needs permission to make such an application. Uh, normally, permission is applied for. But I will accept that he can apply for permission orally in the course of the submission. He did. But I would not grant him that permission. As Mr. Adams himself accepted, Rule 52.30 is a codification of the jurisprudence of this court, starting with Taylor and Lawrence, 2002 EWCA Civ. 90, in which the court held that in exceptional circumstances, the court can reopen an appeal that has been determined. But as new
numerous decisions of this court confirm that Taylor and Lawrence jurisdiction, now encapsulated in Rule 5230, is confined to some serious error of process by which the prior decision can be seen to be not a proper decision at all. The examples in the cases being cases of where the judge has read the wrong papers or where there was bias or fraud or the like. Cases where no real judicial decision <coughs> has been made. That seems to me very far removed from the facts of this case where Mr. Adams sought to persuade us there was some merit in ground three and therefore the court, that is the court hearing the appeal in two weeks' time, ought to allow him to run ground three in order to avoid injustice. That is not what QPR 5230 is designed for and in my submission, in my judgment, would completely undermine the intended finality of decisions on the application of the commission. In those circumstances, my conclusion is that the pre-2016 decisions continue to apply if permission has been granted to limit it to that ground. The other grounds have necessarily been refused and the full court hearing the appeal will not, whatever its theoretical jurisdiction, save in the exceptional circumstances covered by Rule 5230, reopen the question. I would refuse, therefore, the application by the appellant to rely on ground three and I would go further and for the avoidance of that direct that he may not renew this or any similar application or indeed any of the other grounds covered in ground three at the hearing of the Atlantic Court in two weeks' time. The third question which was raised this morning was if our conclusions were, as I have suggested they should be, what should be done about the application to extend time for service of the appellant's skeleton. But it is not necessary to consider that in more detail because Mr. Adams accepts it and he would in those circumstances be content to rely on his original skeleton as indeed the practical direction envisaging appellants may well choose to do. That would, of course, in the light of what I have said, not enable him to argue the point there deployed in relation to ground three or ground two or any of the other grounds other than ground five in the appeal of the Atlantic Court. I agree and there is nothing that I wish to add. Now, picking things up from there, first of all, can you, between you please, prepare, agree and send in a draft order reflecting what my Lord has said? The other matter that obviously arises is costs. My Lord, I can't resist a cost of experience. I don't want my learned friend to suggest to you on that, but I also have an application for QTP. An application for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, that is refused and there is no question in our mind of any stay. Anything else arising? Well, I do seek not only an order for costs, but also I would invite the Court to assess those costs summarily if the Court was so 
prepared to do so. There are a few cost schedules which have been submitted to the court. There are, aren't there? Yes. Have you got copies by any chance? Ah. reason there are two is although the first and second respondents are acting as a team, as it were, the cost orders that were made by His Honour Judge Jarman uh, following the trial were slightly different in relation to the two of them, so it was thought best to split the costs. But beyond that, there's no particular significance to the fact that they're two, but they are, they are um, cumulative as opposed to covering the same thing. Are they everything the same amount? They're not. I think it's very similar, I think, is the... Uh, that. No, not quite. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure I, I know the reason why, why they're different. Certainly my fee has been split um, between the two of them. Um, you're instructed by Mitchell Moore's on. I am, indeed. Um, can you help at all without my having to look it up on whether the uh, hourly rates put in for the different grades uh, are accord with the guidance in relation to I think these rates are, are significantly higher than the rates which are in the in, in the white book. But the white book rates, frankly, simply don't reflect the reality of the costs of, of any solicitors in, in any part of the country in my respectful submission. So they're, they're certainly above those rates. Perhaps I, what I ought to, to say, um, can as you, well as, I'm sorry, Robert. Well, when we're looking at rates, can you explain why the rates are different? Is one client more expensive to deal with than another? I don't think the rates for the two clients are different. Well, they are. They appear to be. If one looks at the grade I see. Vivienne right. Williams, um, one of your clients secures her services at a cost of £375 an hour, but the other one has to pay £435 an hour. Well, that's... that's, that's um, the system of, of, uh, of application of rates to files, um, which is in, employed by Mitchell Moores, which goes up uh, at specific points in time, such as the 1st of May, um, when, when the 1st of May came, that the increase in rates should have been applied to both files, um, because there are different files for each client, for the reasons which I've just briefly out outlined. Um, however, it wasn't applied to, um, to, to Gerwin, I think it was. Uh, and therefore, he hasn't been charged that which he should have been charged or would have been charged if the correct rate had been applied. He's, yeah. getting, he's, getting, he's getting cheap. He's getting cheaper. <laughs> oh, Lord, yes. So that, that is the explanation. And, and just to be clear, there's, one. There's, there's no question of revisiting those rates. Um, Mr. Williams, having been charged at those rates, that is what he's been charged. Indeed. So the indemnity principle applies. Um, I don't know if it's necessary to do so, but were it, I, I would submit that the cost should be assessed on the indemnity basis in any event. This is a very long-running matter. So why do you say it might not be necessary to do so? Uh, well, if, the, if, there's no, if there's no question about the, the total amount, then I don't need to establish that you, you, you can look beyond questions of reasonableness and proportionality. I think if you want us to assess it on an indemnity basis, you probably want to ask for that. Well, in that case, I will ask them to be assessed on the indemnity basis. Um, this uh, hearing and this application is, is one of a number of, of different attempts which have been made by the, um, the, the appellant to, 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 to sidestep the effects of the original grant of permission. Uh, e each one has, has been um, batted away, if I may especially put it like that, by the, the Court of Appeal. Uh, and it has even been pursued to the Supreme Court, and, and that also has not um, been successful. All the time, my clients have been having to, to, to pay to, to their, their lawyers to deal with those applications. We've been invited on, on occasion to put in submissions to the court and we have done so. Orders for costs have been made repeatedly throughout this litigation in, in favour of my clients. Not a penny has been paid to them yet. 
overall, the, the conduct um, of this matter by the appellant is something which is sufficiently out of the ordinary uh, that it is a matter which ought to attract indemnity costs. There's no reason why my clients should be left having to pay any of, or bear any of the costs of this process when this, um, in my respect, is, I would respectfully submit, misconceived application is being pursued so, so very far. So I would ask you to be assessed on the indemnity basis. Um, but, but if you weren't prepared to do so, I would nonetheless ask them to be assessed in this amount in any event, because I would submit those are reasonable and proportionate costs, um, given the nature of this litigation. Just so we know what we're dealing with, um, I don't know if you've got a white book there. 1435 has, I think, the current guideline rate. I have it on online. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's Mitchell Moore's in Bristol, isn't it? It is, Moore, yes. Therefore, I think your national one for the purposes of the guideline rates. you say, well, we should go by those rates anyway, but just so I'm clear what we're dealing with. <laughs> we, uh, I'm sorry that my, my, my computer's taking a while to catch up, but, but, but yes, my Lord, they, they are at uh, Bristol. They would be, that's, that's the rate which would um, be the guideline rate. Um, yes. And perhaps we ought just to look into these schedules a, a bit to understand what you are charging for. Um, Take say um, the work on document, uh, individual items, reviewing and amending bundle indices. In one case, it's four point nine hours. The other case, it's five point eight hours. Then instructions to cancel one point one hours or zero point nine hours. Why are there the, why are there those distinctions? I think it, it's effectively a decision taken by the solicitors about what's the appropriate way to divide it. Uh, originally, the, the, the way that the hours were split between um, Gerwin and Susan was two thirds, one third. Um, the solicitors have, have, have taken a view about what's the appropriate proportion. So it, it's an arbitrary decision. Um, the figures are, are more or less the same. But it, it, I can't explain it more clearly than that, if I may put it that way. So, so on this thesis, the aggregate figure is <coughs> might be more important than the it, it, it is, my lord, yes. Yes, I see. And in aggregate, if I just do my maths, um, I think you're claiming £28,958.80p. I think it's like £29,000. No, no, I did, I'm, I'm, if I didn't say 29,000, I meant 29,000. 29,958 pounds of ATP, is that my Lord makes it? Yeah. Yes, my Lord.
Um, thank you very much. Mr. Adams. <coughs> My Lords, I'm, I'm very much in your Lordship's hands. Uh, uh, the national rent for band one, which is Bristol, uh, is some is two hundred and sixty one pounds, which is approximately two thirds of the average of um, the rough. It's a very rough um, calculation on sort of four three five and three seven five. That's sort of about, about four hundred. It's um, roughly <coughs> two thirds. Um, what is an uh, uh, appropriate? Your Lordships consider as an appropriate sum to incur an application like this is very much a matter for your Lordships. But uh, perhaps one approach would be to uh, cut the two figures down by two thirds. Do you mean by two thirds or by one third? By one third, sorry, I mean two two thirds. Yes. Your turn to. Um, Mr. if anything you want to well, I, I, say in reply well, before I, my well, Lord and I go out from I there. resist. I resist um, the suggestion there should be any reduction, let alone as much as, as two-thirds. The reality is, isn't my clients are liable to pay these costs? Simple as that. The court has a discretion. Guideline rates are only guidelines. Uh, and the reality is that this is complicated litigation, which has, has uh, occupied the Court of Appeal for a considerable period of time. And it's not surprising that the rates... I think I'll go up there.
do think it's appropriate to assess the cost summarily, uh, and moreover, for us to approach uh, the assessment by reference to the indemnity basis rather than the standard basis. Uh, for the indemnity basis to be appropriate, of course, uh, circumstances must take the case out of the norm. Uh, it seems to us that the circumstances of this case are out of the norm. Uh, there have been multiple applications, uh, both at this level and indeed in the Supreme Court, going over much the same ground. And uh, as regards uh, this final application with which we have been concerned today, uh, what in effect was being sought was to uh, raise uh, a ground of appeal which had already been uh, the subject of previous decisions uh, by the approach of asking for an extension of time in which to put in a skeleton argument ranging uh, very substantially beyond the uh, uh, ground that Lord Justice Lewison had said that he is intending to allow uh, to be argued. Uh, moreover, in terms of today's application, uh, the uh, matter seemed sufficiently clear uh, for us uh, not to call on uh, Mr. James Spear Smith, who appeared for the respondents, albeit uh, that we uh, did have and took account of uh, his helpful uh, skeleton argument. At any rate, as I say, uh, we consider it appropriate to assess the costs on the indemnity basis, and doing the best we can, uh, we uh, consider that we should uh, assess in respect of each of the two respondents, uh, solicitors' uh, fees in the sum of £8,000 plus VAT, and counsel's fees in the sum of £3,750 plus VAT. So when you do please prepare and lodge this order, can the order uh, proceed on that basis? <laughs>